uh, Mr. Cloud. Thank you. Uh, kind of picking up where we left off, um, one of the issues we were talking about was housing. I appreciated you mentioning the trailers. Uh, we had conversations about that offline, um, about the amazing cost of it. One of the other issues that was kind of complicating um, it was the FEMA staff that would be deployed uh, would often take up the available temporary housing that residents could use for recovery. Uh, my question is, meanwhile, trailers are sitting on an airstrip waiting for the approval process to be placed uh, in, where they could, with residents who need recovery. So uh, has FEMA considered using those trailers to house its own employees? freeing up the temporary housing space to allow residents back into their communities. Many would have to stay at hotels two hours away because the local ones were taken up by FEMA employees and then not available to help with their own recovery process. Yep, and, and, and I, that's a very fair and great question. Um, it's something that we have to balance very delicately. The last thing that I want to do is have my response staff taking up rooms that we're also trying to um, utilized through our transitional shelter uh, capabilities. And so we want to be able to access those hotels for disaster victims or disaster survivors. And what we try to do is set up base camps. We try to, uh, for our own responders, um, but it, it always takes us a, a couple of days to get our feet with under, you know, underneath us when we, when we respond. Um, the second part, when it comes to utilizing trailers, here again, uh, we're having to stage trailers all over the country right now because of what's gone on in Paradise or what's gone on in Michael and, and, and still, you know, the issues that are coming in Texas. The biggest thing that stands in the way of us typically getting trailers put into place is local permitting and ordinances like the Not In My Backyard ordinances that, that actually delay us from being able to get get it into the property. And then if you look at, you know, Paradise, California, which is the worst disaster I've ever seen in my life, and all of you should take a trip over there and go see uh, what the devastation was in, in California, is that there's nothing to hook a trailer up to. There's no supporting infrastructure whatsoever. And, um, you know, housing is incredibly difficult. So I go back to what I, what I think would be best is granting authority. Um, you know, if I, if I could block grant that funding to Governor Abbott, and Governor Abbott could follow his own procurement laws to go buy every travel trailer that's in the state of Texas, that's the way the model should work, rather than me having to go through a large contract and purchasing manufactured housing units from some other you know, company located wherever. Governor Abbott ought to be able to go to all the lots in Texas that sell travel trailers and, and buy them at a market, you know, competitive market rate. That's how it should work. Uh, thank you. We, we talked about the process, the length of the process, if I can just, as a visual aid, that's the FEMA process. Yeah. Uh, and uh, very, very complicated. Uh, and, and in spite of what people are going through, um, you know, I talked to someone in Smithville, they had three different site visits to the same site, each with teams of seven people, each not aware of what the previous team had done. Uh, in Wharton, they had seven site visits to the same river each time with a different team. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a $10,000 grant that one small community was applying for that had the same 32 approval touch points as, as someone yeah. applying for a, a million dollar grant. Yep. Uh, so um, my question really is, uh, how can FEMA reform the process uh, so that it's streamlined, but also so that yeah. there's a single point of contact and a single warehouse of information uh, so that, right. you know, ideally staff wouldn't change, but when it does have to change, that they have access to what's been done to this point, because so many times it, it just felt like starting from scratch eight months into the process. Uh, yep, so, so goal number three under uh, reduce the complexity, uh, what I think would be best is that if we submitted for the record what we're trying to do to reduce the burden of in the process, you know, if you go back to um, I believe it was Harvey, and, and um, we need to go back and confirm the numbers. But I think as a result of Harvey, we had to physically perform 2.3 million home inspections. Why can't we just use technology? Well, here's why. Because if we, if we use technology and we get something wrong, then I get hit with a negative OIG report. Well, and so we're point, having to strike the right balance. To so your point, there would be <laughs> residents who had the forethought to think, before I start making my own home repairs, I'm going to take pictures of my house. Right. The very, of or, the mold or, damage. Why can't I use satellite imagery? But and because aerial it imagery? wasn't yeah. 
FEMA ta taken by a FEMA rep, uh, those photos were not submissible. Exactly. As and, and that's where so. FEMA wants to go. Trust me, we want to make things streamlined and cut down the time frame. But, you know, and I learned this. Harvey, I had been in office two months, and Harvey was my first real disaster of going through. And I, it blew my mind that it, it, it takes 17,000 people to go do 2.3 million home inspections. That's a ridiculous process. Do we not have technology, satellite imagery or aerial imagery or, you know, take the word for uh, of the citizen to be able to do it and rapidly approve it. Now, we get hit all the time because we're not protecting against fraud, but I would argue that fraud is pre that the, the, the fraud that might be fraud encountered is minimal compared to the contract it takes me to do the home inspections. So it's, it's a balance, but then I'm caught in a rock and a hard place because if I don't protect against fraud, I'm, I'm dragged in front of a committee and told you're not protecting against fraud. So we have to strike the right balance, and I agree. That process is too long. We have to do what we can to cut forward. I'm not a fan of 2 CFR uh, that, that guides how money is put forward. I think it's, there's two different standards. There's a double standard for the federal government or the state governments and the local governments. And we need to go through that, fine tune it, and streamline it and put, put money forward. I think after a disaster, everybody is trying to do the best that they can and to move as quickly as they can. And I know my it, agency is working on it. It would seem to me that, uh, for all the best intentions of eliminating waste that we've created a system of waste. Mm -hmm. um, I look forward to your report to see the specifics sure. of how that's being done. I know my time is limited, so I'll, I'll submit further questions in, uh, to you and look forward to your response. But Thank you. Appreciate Trust it. me, we're after the same thing. We want to accomplish the same no thing doubt. as, no doubt. as uh, streamlining. Gentleman yields back. 